Greetings, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to the week that was on Deadline Detroit. I'm your host, Craig Folly, and another week of news to go through with my special panel, which always includes Alan Lengel, who is the editor and co-founder of Deadline Detroit. Hello, Alan. Hello, hello. Thanks Nancy Derringer, me. contributor to Deadline Detroit, is here as well. Thank you very much. Always great. All right, our friend Daryl Dossie, who is a contributor to Deadline Detroit, also works at Wayne State University in their communications department. Daryl, welcome back. It's a pleasure. Good to be here. All right, and my friend M.L. Elric of the Detroit Free Press, also the host of another great podcast, which, of course, is called M.L.'s Soul of Detroit. We appreciate you being here, sir. And look, at I see you're always representing right there. It's a smart idea. I got to get better with this whole marketing thing. But thank you. Every being- day I'm hustling. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly. <laughs> hey, that's, that's what we get to do in this day and age of, of media is, is hustle because uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover and a lot of stuff going on. Um, all right. So here's what, I'm, here's what I'm trying to figure out trying to figure out what is the bigger story this week was it the republican national convention or was it the fact that we had another ridiculous police action in wisconsin i i I honestly think the bigger story is indeed wisconsin uh and what is happening there and i'm going to start with that today uh because you had a situation where the police shot a guy in the back seven times seven times because he might have had a knife in the car Might have had a knife in the car seven times. The same city. You've got a 17-year-old white kid with an AR-15 walking down the street with people pointing at him saying, hey, that guy just shot some people and the cops just let him go. Asked him if he was okay and he gets to keep walking down the street. If this is not the exact example of what everybody is complaining about when it comes to two justice systems in this country, I don't know if it could get any plainer than that. We just got another, uh, another view of what's going on there right now. People don't want to see what's happening out there. They don't want to admit that something bad is happening in this country when it comes to this sort of stuff. But I'm not sure it could be any more blatant than what we just saw in Wisconsin. Who wants to jump in on that one? Well, I mean, uh, I that. all right, go yeah, ahead, Daryl. I, I think it's, I, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with your sentiment, Craig. I think you got the right sentiment, but I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's been blatant like that for a very, sure. very, very long time. Um, the problem is, you know, white America doesn't believe black people. And I think that even in the age of video, um, you know, we have a situation where you still have a lot of people who want to, dem- some people want to dismiss these things as one-off isolated incidents, or they're looking for reasons why, you know, this action happened. There's no justification for shooting this man seven times in the back, just like there's no justification for the murder of Alden Sterling or Eric Garner or Emmett Till or you know any of the other you know you know you know thousands of, of black men, women, and children who've been killed by you know racist authorities and racist forces in this country. Um, I think that you know the thing with uh, the, the the situation that we have here is obviously you know it dovetails um, with you know what happened with George Floyd. Uh, what's happening with, you know, Breonna Taylor, um, and obviously with with what is a ratcheting up of the racist rhetoric that we're hearing from the Republican Party and from Donald Trump in particular. Um, You ask, you know, which is the more important of the two? Well, yeah, I agree with you that. I think Wisconsin is more important because somebody was was, was killed here. But, you know, it's also a situation where, you know, this, this situation is gaining steam and it's gaining momentum in part because of the rhetoric that is being used at the highest levels of government. I mean, if this were, you know, I remember when I was a kid and I would hear, you know, some of what I heard at the Republican convention around race. I mean, I would hear that from the fringes of the right wing, the John Burke Society, people like that. But this stuff has moved squarely into the mainstream. I mean, this is Trumpism at this point and Trumpism is the Republican party. And so when you talk about how these things fit, you know, when you look at the murder of this young man, uh, uh, Jacob Blake, uh, I mean, the killer of the shooting, of this man because he's paralyzed from what I understand. The shooting of this man in Kenosha, Wisconsin, I mean, it dovetails perfectly with the rhetoric that we're hearing, the the, the continuing, the ongoing weaponization of state violence uh, against black people and black men in particular, and uh, more importantly, against unarmed black people. You know, this doesn't happen as much to arm black folks. This is why, you know, I just read a story where black people are, you know, 57% of new gun sales are going to African Americans because black folks are getting tired of this shit. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, all of this, you know, you couple that then with the shooting in Kenosha, you know, by, apparently by this young man who's a Trump supporter and, a, you know, a glorifier of the police. And I mean, what you have is a situation where 
this stands out as the sort of um, breaking point moment because we are on the precipice of seeing, you know, all our war against black. I mean, you know, young white men armed to the teeth are in the streets shooting down protesters. And I know to the two people who were murdered were white, or at least that's my understanding of the situation. But, you know, these are people who are still themselves putting themselves on the front line of, you know, the struggle against well, that, that's That's the whole thing, though, Daryl, that I was talking about. I mean, you know, the police just look at this guy. People are pointing at that kid after he shot three people saying he just shot some people and they let him walk by. He I, said, don't think, I don't think that would have happened. I don't think that would have happened if the guy I was black. I think somebody. the cops would have shot him in the street right then and there. And, and I mean, it just... You know, you're, you're allowed to walk around with an AR-15. These militia groups are basically saying we have to go patrol the cities. Those cops should have been like, go home, cowboy. Get the hell out of here. We don't want your help. This is not helping the situation. Instead, but they, didn't. they gave instead, him a they were bottle. giving him bottled water and uh, going through their, their cop megaphone. We appreciate you guys. Yeah, ex so, exactly. This is the same police department that shot Jacob Blake seven times. And so... You know, if you want federal troops in Kenosha, yes, let's bring some federal troops in and tell the local cops to freaking stay home. You know, well, I mean, and tell tell the freaking wannabe cops and militia people yes. to stay home as well, because you're not helping the situation. I, I honestly think there are some people out there that see this as some sort of fantasy that they're going to finally start the race war. They've all been, you know, expecting to come for a long time. And somehow these people are feeling justified in doing this shit and it's just scaring the hell out of me. Well, I think, exactly. I think the White House. <laughs> well, I, and the, I, the pushback from, hold on, I'll one yeah, quick point go ahead, here. Go the ahead. pushback from Fox News and, you know, Tucker Carlson and various high profile conservatives has been absolutely shameful. Shameful. I mean, they said, well, he was defending himself. And it's like, yeah, he was defending himself because the crowd was after him because he had already shot somebody. And then last night in Kenosha, I just saw on Twitter from a Chicago reporter, there was another guy, an older man uh, who claimed to be a Vietnam vet who had a gun in his car and uh, the police arrested him, thank God. But he said, why are you arresting me when I'm here to help you? So, yeah. I mean, this, this narrative is spreading. Go ahead, Alan. I was going to say, I mean, it's interesting, the narrative, the, the post uh, incidents. We, you know, we posted a story about a uh, guy who played for the Detroit Tigers in 2009. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and and he's, you know, he's just uh, tweeting all all the stuff about the guy was a criminal and he was charged with this this or that. And the point is, yes, some of the people who have, you know, may have uh, a criminal, his, you know, uh, uh, convictions or whatever, but. It does not justify, it's our, our justice system is not set up so that police are the executioners. They're set up that people who violate the law go to court and decision, you know, the justice department, the justice system is supposed to play out. It's not supposed to be that you have a right to execute somebody. And then the post story is, well, that person was a bad person anyways. Well, our justice system is, is not set up that way. We don't, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have the death penalty. Uh, we give people second chances for different crimes. People get to come back out of prison. We don't give life sentences for everything. And the system is just set up. And, and so how do you justify, you know, I, I have a, a friend who retired from the, the Detroit Police Department, uh, an investigator. And he was saying back in the old days, cops would, you know, you, you'd go at it with somebody on the street. If there was something going on, you didn't pull out your gun. And he says, the problem is a lot of the white cops are afraid of black people. And so they're pulling out guns and they're, they're willing to shoot and they don't want to get it, you know, and it's, and, and look, it's a tough job. I, I mean, it's, it's a job that we chose not to do for whatever reason. Uh, but it's a job that we need, we need police out there, but we need good police and we need, you know, there has to be a smarter way to deal with it. You know, not shooting a guy seven times. I mean, why not, you know, two guys jump on the guy and take him down or something. There, there's gotta be some alternatives to shooting the guy seven times in the back, you know, of course, go ahead, ML. So I just need to get the dynamics here clear. I thought Alan was the boss, but Nancy told him to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> how do, how do things how work works. over That's there? That's how it works at Deadline. Hey, it's my show. Oh, stuff can oh, happen here on my newsroom, show. Man. Okay, sh then be, be quiet, Craig, because I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm talking now.
Soul of Detroit's taking over here. And that's ML Soul of Detroit. I don't pretend to speak to everybody in the city. But, but here's my thing. What we're hearing now is, oh, he had a knife. It turns out the knife might have been in the car. Oh, George Floyd was passing counterfeit bills. He brought the police attention upon himself. And I think there's something to be said about that. But I have yet to see anywhere in the statutes that uh, passing a $20 counterfeit bill is a, uh, is a death penalty offense and that Judge Dredd is riding the streets in his futuristic motorcycle to mete out justice on the spot. I, I have yet to be convinced that, that this knife was a threat to any officer if indeed uh, Mr. Blake had it on his possession. Has anyone you, found you, it? Even in, okay, Alan, jump in on Nancy and then Craig, you jump in on Alan because it's your show. <laughs> but, Has anyone found it? That's my question. Well, all I'm saying is even a ninja can't throw a throwing star between your eyeballs if he's walking away from you. I mean, for all these Second Amendment folks, and, and I'm, I, I understand there's a right to bear arms for all these people who are for law and order, even going back to the Wild West when it really was the Wild West and when Wisconsin actually might have been the Western frontier, when you shoot a man in the back, you're not a man. You're certainly not a lawman. And there's no excuse for it. So anybody who wants to excuse this, just put on your hood because that's bullshit. And as long as that keeps going on, the marching's going to keep going on. And this country's going to keep getting torn apart. So you want the marches to stop? Stop killing people. Well, and actually Live up do, to your something. Own. do something that actually levels the playing field a little bit because we have heard a lot well, of do something talk before. about police reforms, but we've heard a lot about police reforms, but we have yet to see very much of it enacted anywhere yet. And, you know, people are like, well, hey, the marches will die down eventually. Well, what are they pissed off about? And if you can't see what people are pissed off about at this point in time, then you're really not trying. Your eyes are shut or your head is in the sand, one of the two. If you cannot admit if you cannot admit that we have a problem in this country when it comes to institutional racism, especially in the police, then you are just not being intellectually honest in any way, shape, or form. That's, I, can't, I can't put it any other way. I if, wouldn't limit it to the police. Look at all the excusers out there. I mean, it's well, getting said, harder and harder. Especially in the to, police. Yeah, but, well, you know, it, it's, I think, it's, I think it's, it's pretty bad all over the place. But when you look at the excuses that are being made for these people, they're getting more and more outrageous. You know, it's like, well, 10 years ago, this guy spit on the sidewalk. I'm like, and now we're in COVID. So maybe he's spreading a pandemic. He's like, did you really run his record to see if he spit on the sidewalk 10 years ago? I just don't think so. I'm sorry. Yeah. None of that really matters. That, like, no. it doesn't matter how flimsy. We, this is a country that, that treated black. We were brought here as goats and chickens. We were brought here as tools of industry. This country has never, ever truly embraced or understood or respected the full scope of the breadth of humanity of black people. So it's like, you know, it does, the excuses don't, it, it, it doesn't, we whistle at a white woman, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? It's never mattered. And see, this is the thing that I'm trying to, you know, that I always put forward to people because, you know, I got my little t-shirts, it's Black Lives Matter. But I tell people, you know, Black Lives Matter, that's not just a statement, right? Because the thing, what has to happen is the question that has to follow is, okay, if Black Lives Matter, then what? Because see, you know, I, you know, we've seen scores and scores. I was just talking about talking to somebody else about this earlier today. We've seen scores and scores of these videos, and, you know, black men being beaten, you know, from Rodney King, you know, all the way through. We, we know what's happening out there. And I think that people need to understand that just like what you saw in professional sports, you saw an escalation. You saw an escalation uh, from Colin Kaepernick taking a knee peacefully in respect to the flag as, as, as advised by a veteran who said, this is the way you should, you should honorably protest. We saw him run out of the league, vilify, uh, you know, Trump jumping on stage, calling, you know, uh, black athletes, SOBs and all this kind of nonsense. We went from that, LeBron James, these guys trying to come out and they're, you know, Black Lives Matter t-shirts, I can't breathe, being told to shut up and dribble. And now what you see, see, you've got people, because people don't understand how integral black people are to this country. You know, you consider that, you know, we help build this bad boy. And people can say all that they want to say about, you know, about the, the dispensability of black folk. But one thing, these brothers, now you've got them walking off the court. You're, gonna have, you, you're looking at the prospect of canceling entire seats. We are, we are still the tools of billion dollar industries in this country. And at some point, you know, people are going to say, what difference does it make? You know, people are saying, well, these athletes are so privileged, you know, they should be thankful for the opportunity to be out there and to do their thing. But at some point, 
you know, all your comfort, your luxury, all the things, these things don't matter if anybody's alive to just walk up and shoot you. I tell people, all the videos I've seen, the one that breaks my heart the most is the Philando Castile video. Because, because, because see, here was a man who was armed legally. He was, he was prepared to defend himself and his family. He surrendered. He surrendered that right when he was, fed, when he was confronted by a police officer. He did everything right. So you can't talk to me about, you know, he had a knife on the floorboard of the car or, you know, the, the gun looked like it was. I don't give a damn because it's too many times we see black people who do everything that they're asked to do. Did the NRA stand up for him? I mean, the very same people who, you know, give you, nobody stood up for this man. And this man was, a, you know, this, this was a man, you know, I mean, this was a violation of every, I mean, every single country, every single amendment you can possibly think of in this country. And this man did everything right. So we get to a point where it's like, you're now, at, you know, you're worried about people burning down property and, you know, you know, you're glorifying these people who step out on their lawns with the pistols and the ARs, you know, ready to shoot folks who are peacefully walking by. You have to start asking, the James Ball we talked about, we talked about the fire next time. And you have to start asking yourself, at what point, because white people wouldn't go for this. You destroy the whole, a whole colony, a whole country was created because white folks weren't buying this type of shit. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like, at what point do you say to yourself, this is not simply about <laughs> electing uh, uh, or electing Joe Biden over Donald Trump. This is about disconnecting whole systems. This is about dismantling everything that makes us comfortable, everything that a lot, this is about investigating uh, uh, vetting and going through and dismantling everything that this country is about. Because it's not just about the police department. It's not just about the health department. It's not just about the quality. <laughs> of the, the very nature of the United States of America means that in order for it to thrive, it has to eat black people and black people have to eat the failures of this country. This is what all this is about. Not just about one man getting shot again and again. That's, no. that's uh, really what it's about. And I, I don't think uh, that I could ever say anything as powerful as what I just heard from Daryl Dossie right there. Uh, you know, but Daryl, you did bring up something. You brought up the, that couple in St. Louis that were standing out there holding their weapons at the peaceful protests as they were walking to the mayor's house in St. Louis. All you need to know about the Republican National Convention is that those two morons were invited to speak at it. They were there. They were representing the Republican Party and their lack of a platform there. Basically, their platform this year, as we witnessed over the last four days, is to scare the living shit out of the four white people on this screen and demonize the one black person I have on today and sit there and say, if Joe Biden is elected, somehow what Daryl was talking about <coughs> is going to happen and your life is going to be ruined. Well, you, you know, know what? I'm, I'm like not scared. Go ahead, ML. It's funny. It, no, I, I mean, uh, all right. Last, I mean, last night, just watching, I, I, I've tried to watch as painful as it was watching all week and, you know, talking about, you know, hearing Mike Pence and hearing uh, Trump talk and, and, and saying, you know, if Joe Biden gets in there, it's going to be like chaos in the streets and, and disorder and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, it, you mean like now? <laughs> I yeah, mean, this, it, you're, it's you're like what this is, is Joe Biden's the, America? No, this is Donald the, Trump's America. The disconnect there is just so great. And, you know, I, 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 it was interesting. I was watching MSNBC this morning and the woman whose husband, the St. Louis uh, cop who was killed during some rioting or something like that. She, you know, she had a, a pretty big part in, in last night's uh, ceremonies and she was attending. And so this morning, her stepchildren said that her husband would have been so disappointed and would have been so against her showing up and trying to memorialize him because he thought Trump was a racist, that he didn't agree with Trump's comment, racist comments about his comments about Colin Kobernick. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the, the shamefulness of, of that whole thing last night. And it was like, as you know, as Van Jones said the other day, when uh, Rick Santorum said, it looks like, this was a couple nights ago where Rick Santorum said, it looks yeah. like the Republicans are really reaching out to people of color. <laughs> and, and Van Jones is like, what? He goes, it looks like you guys are pretending to be us tonight. It's like, it's, it's like the whole sham 
of suddenly, you know, this whole week, it looked like the Republican Party was the most integrated party. And not, in, and not to excuse, look, the Democrats have fallen short in some areas, but they've certainly tried harder than the Republicans have. But if you watch oh. the Republican uh, convention well, I this think week, we have, I, that may be, there it is. Yeah. If you watch the Republican convention this week, it was like the most integrated. I mean, it was like, is it was like, uh, you know, one black person after another talking well, about well, how great the Republicans were. Well, remember talking Donald about Trump. the party of Lincoln, which Lincoln would not be part Lincoln would not be a Demi uh, Republican. I'm sorry. No, he would. It, not. it would not be the party. Away the Confederate flag. Like it's a disconnect there that I, I really don't understand. All right, ML, we, we cut you off earlier. Go for it. Oh, okay. So I, I have this fantasy situation, like uh, one of these, the sci-fi things where you take people from different times and put them together and see what happens. In my fantasy, those two jokers from the mansion in St. Louis square up with Nicholas Sandman, and I'd like to see the look on their face as they stare at each other. And then we'll see who gets all shitty about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you know, like I said, the, from, from the opening moments of that convention, when it was, uh, I believe, Donald Trump Jr. speaking on the first night, uh, to his father finishing things off last night, I mean, this was basically, you know, uh, it, it, again, they have nothing else to sell but fear. Uh, that's all they've got. And and I mean, if you look at the and somebody mentioned the NRA earlier. Have you seen these ads? The NRA is running right now about if Joe Biden's elected and the woman's in her car about to get carjacked and she had a gun, but then it disappears because Joe Biden was elected. And they have basically a busted car window and a bunch of debris laid out on the street. You have no idea what happened to this lady. But if it wasn't for you know, if Joe Biden she gets was elected, sold women are going to be getting trafficking. yanked out of their cars. And and it's just like. It's so frustrating. And the other thing is that Donald Trump tried to give the impression last night that this coronavirus thing is behind us. Did anybody yeah. else notice that part? Yeah. You know I who didn't notice that? Herman Cain mass. didn't notice that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Herman Cain's team is still tweeting in his name from yeah. the grave. Apparently. But I'm saying talking about how great Donald Trump is. Herman Cain powerful. probably died because he went to the rally in Oklahoma. And how does Trump follow up with 2,000 people at the White House sitting on top of each other without masks? Well, and somebody told me, and I don't know if this is true, but somebody told me that they were encouraging people not to wear masks at the event last night. Now, I don't know if they had screening that was going on before this thing. I somehow doubt that Donald Trump would allow all these people without being some sort of at least temperature checked to come onto the White House grounds. Um, which, by the way, is, is probably a violation of the Hatch Act uh, to do this yesterday. So we, we basically witnessed Donald Trump's team violate several laws over the last few days in this convention. No, 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 no. You got it. I don't know what you were watching, Craig. You got it all wrong. This is the law and order party. Yeah. <laughs> this is the part. Unless you violate the law, then this is the pardon party. The, the, the name of this, this, this party should now be Pardon Me. Well, <laughs> hey, look, you've seen we've seen the story. Miles Taylor, who used to work in the Trump team, basically said that Trump was handing out the pardons like candy and to people saying, hey, if you break the law while enforcing these things I want to do on immigration, I will pardon you. That's an allegation suggesting that the president was willing to pardon people before they committed a crime, just saying, if you commit a crime, don't worry, I've got your back, which is a mind blowing allegation that got swept under the rug this week because of the convention and what's going on in Kenosha. But if he was doing that, uh, that he's encouraging people oh, you to break mean that the law. Would be impeachable? Yeah. It's, it's, not it's, just impeachable. I, I think that's like the kind of thing that you could actually go after him for after he leaves office. Well, they thought it might've been obstruction of justice during the Mueller investigation. And Mueller just, for whatever reason, couldn't, couldn't stick to the law, which was interesting. But, but I think we've seen an evolution in Trump. Now he's, if he's with Billy Bush, Although I guess the Bushes don't want to be anywhere near him now because they are Republicans. Um, he would say, you know, it's great when you're president, you can grab him by the pardon. <laughs> you can do anything you want. Uh, but yeah, so, so that's, that's something that, I mean, just somebody who is you know, just so openly flouting the, 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 hey, the Senate and laws. The, the Senate has made it clear. He banged a porn star without a rubber when his wife just yeah. had a baby. <laughs> Who's surprised by anything? The Republican Senate has made it clear. They've sent a message to him. Do not worry. Whatever you do is okay because you're not going to get in trouble. The Justice Department has made it clear. We're not going to charge you with anything. The Senate has made it clear. We're not going to convict you, you know on an impeachment. So do whatever. And he's doing whatever he wants. Well, 
and he also gets a free pass, and this is something that I've been struggling with since before he was elected, but he also gets a free pass from the evangelicals out there, um, oh, in, including our good friend Jerry Falwell Jr. We needed oh. to get to Jerry Jr. <laughs> out here. Um, yeah, his wife's not available. Apparently, somebody's cleaning their pool. <laughs> well, Jerry, which is more than yeah. just the pool Jerry. boy. Uh, yeah, she, he was quite... snake in the drain, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the filter gets um, clogged up. Uh, but Jerry Falwell Jr. stepped down from Liberty University, but then apparently did not. Um, we're not exactly sure, but he no, he's did. Gone now. Yeah, yeah but he, he stepped did, with a boot in his ass. He did admit. <laughs> he did admit that his wife had an affair. The part that he did not admit, that the pool boy does admit, is that well, yes, his wife had an affair while he watched, <laughs> which is always interesting. Um, so where it, were his it, hands <laughs> while he was watching? I, I don't, don't want to know. Was he grabbing a Bible? Question. It's called but adult there, supervision. Is there anything oh, maybe more fun lifeguard. than watching the self-righteous, uh, you know, get knocked down a peg? Um, because, you know, these are people that suggest that they have better morals than the rest of us. And then we see that they are actually suggest. just like the rest of us. Suggest. They don't suggest. They just tell you right Insist. to your face. Go ahead, Daryl. You know, when I was a kid, you know, my mom was into like the PTL show, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, I watched the same stuff happen with them. I watched it happen with Jimmy Swagger. I mean, you know, I grew up in the hood. I remember cats like Reverend Ike, you know. Uh, you know, there are some right-wing ministers who have become prominent in Detroit who have been shamed. You know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say their names or not. But, I mean, it's just like, you know, this this is who they are. You know, and I, I, I don't, I never register surprise. I'm always surprised when I find out that these people are actually, when I meet the, the handful who are actually decent people. I mean, there's a man named Creflo Dollar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, you know what I mean? The, 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 the ministerial circuit. I mean, and this is, this is true, I think, of, you know, all of these structures. I think that, you know, they are designed to kind of be this way. I mean, there's a reason why the Catholic churches is all screwed up as it is. There's a reason why, you know, these mega churches are the way that they are, why this prosperity gospel has become so prominent. I mean, and I think it's, you know, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a non-believer, so I'll be the first person to copy that, you know, I'm an atheist. Okay. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not an atheist because I haven't read the Bible. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm an atheist in part because I grew up a Christian. You know what I'm saying? And I've I read them. You know, I tell people I read these books of the Bible that nobody reads. Like, you know, the Nahums and the Obadiahs. And, you know, you know, Alan knows about all of that. But can I just? I, I'm, can, I, can I? Go ahead. I'm, I'm your point. saying to me, it's been hypocritical from, from the jump. You know, as you were as we were talking about Jerry Falwell, it rang a bell in my elderly head, and I just quick did a quick phone Google. Um, Robert, remember Robert Hansen, the FBI spy who was oh, yeah. um, slipping, sure. uh, yeah, who was slipping secrets well. to the uh, to the Russians. He apparently also installed some sort of uh, concealed uh, cameras in his own bedroom and invited friends to watch him have sex with his wife Bonnie, who for some reason is still married to him. God knows why. Well, I know why, because she considers herself a strict Catholic and that's her husband. But anyway, what is it with these guys who po who posture all the time about, you know, their their superior morality and and cuckolding and kind of cuckolding by a different uh, a different name. It's just, I, I, you know. I can honestly say I don't know the answer to that question. Well, we were just before we started <laughs> recording the we were talking about how that the cuck is the was the <laughs> insult of 2016. That was what the alt right called you know anybody who wasn't with him was just a cuck, and it's like like they say over and over, it's all projection with these guys. It's not so. that there's a huge racial component to, you know, I mean, I've, you know, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm a guy, I've spent my fair share, you know, time on, on, on certain websites. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the subgenres out there, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's some real deep, crazy, sick, psychosexual, racial, Bob the Shower type shit going on. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so, I mean, let's not, you know, I mean, this, this is, this is, all of this, that's what I'm saying, all of this stuff is, you know, and these all go to, right, like the original sins of America. It's pure yeah. time founding, sure. the founding, the black people, the oppression of women. I mean, all of this stuff is just a real sick, you know. Sick, B sick. BBC does not just stand for British Broadcasting Corporation. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's only the second. <laughs> 
there you go. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, uh, we got to move on from Mr. Paul. Well, as many jokes I know that there could be there. Uh, we, we've got a few minutes left, and I, I want to get to this. Uh, anybody shocked at all that we're seeing COVID uh, cases going up on college campuses? Um, I'm shocked. Know, as I'm totally shocked. Going shocked. back to school? I, you know what? I, I wrote in July, I said the idea of, of having college classes on campus is, is not going to work. It's not, they're not going to make it through the fall term. I said, the idea is, I mean, college is just not for going for learning in the classroom. I mean, you go and you socialize and you drink and you smoke and you hook up uh, if you're lucky. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just impossible to keep students apart. I mean, they go to socialize in college. I mean, it's a huge part of college and, they are, you know, very willing to take risks. Well, yeah, it's it's interesting though. I mean, I you know, I did bring my son back up to school on Tuesday, and of course now all the things on campus have been canceled for the semester, so we're stuck with the rent for you know <laughs> the whole year that we got to pay now, and it's all virtual at least for the first semester. We'll see what happens, but you know, I just went up there. I told them, I said, be incredibly careful, and and you know, just watch what these other kids are doing at these other campuses, getting sick, going to these huge parties. Do your best to stay away from them if you can um and hopefully he'll be wise about these things i trust him i think he will be but i mean ml you know you've got kids too it's like what are you gonna do you can't deprive them of this experience but at the same time you know it's it's sort of a scary situation so first of all i'm very concerned about what's happening in college towns and second of all if i was in a college town i'd be doing exactly what these kids are doing uh and i i mean i just i think yeah. I think most of us would be, but I want to tell you a little story about why we're not going to have kids back in classes anytime soon. We went to a graduation party where the family was very uptight about people need to take care of themselves. And we got there. We were the only ones with masks on. It turns out later on a bunch of people who were at the party got really, really sick and they were going up to East Lansing. Their kid was sick. Another kid was sick. And when they closed the dorms, this family's response was to immediately try and find an apartment in East Lansing for this kid. I'm like, you know what? You were already given a sign that you don't have what it takes to stay safe in this. And instead of ignoring that sign, you're like, oh, crap. Now we got to find a place for this kid to live up here. I was like, there's no third strike. I'm sorry. This is going to spread. And it's going to spread. And when there's a vaccine out, I'll tell you who might not want to take the vaccine now. Me, because I don't trust the CDC anymore, because the CDC is a puppet on a string. And they should have been the one government entity. You know, okay, we can argue about the post office. But when the scientists are getting pimped out now, hey, man, me and the anti-vaxxers are both going to be sitting there saying, uh, are you going to take it? You're crazy as hell. No, I'm not yeah. going to take it. You're crazy as hell. I'm not going to take it. We're going to give a high five, cough in each other's face, and die. And that's where America <laughs> ends. Well, and every, anybody who doesn't die is going to get shot by the cops. And, and you know, yeah. the president all, all but promised that there'd be a vaccine by the end of the year. And, uh, you know, this doesn't seem where's like the a, Where's the infrastructure, Bill? He promised that four years ago. Well, it's infrastructure week still, Mike. It's an ongoing thing. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, infrastructure week started in 2016, and it's still going on, even though the only infrastructure dollars we've seen are about three miles of new wall and some reconstruction of some existing barriers I, that exist. I, that's I, about could, it. And Bannon paid for that down. portion of the wall, right? Oh, yeah. yeah I, I, well, I, I could see down in Mexico where like every few weeks they say, Hey, have you seen the invoice for the wall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll pay that one right away. You know, yeah, you yeah. Think, make you sure think the Mexican government's getting like getting, you know, people calling them on the phone, like debt collectors every day going, Hey, where's the money for the wall? They're like, Oh, Hey, I'm not home. Click. <laughs> hey, right. You're behind. <laughs> wrong number. Click. The wall here. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. no, so let, let me let me do, do just a quick little historical recap here, because Trump's policies, whatever, I think people should should vote for whomever they think has the right policies. My issue with Trump is he's a liar and he's trying to undermine the credibility of the media, because if you can't stick to the truth, then you try and denut the truth tellers. But I seem to remember a fella named Barack Obama. You know, I, I guess he wasn't American. That's what I, I heard from, from Trump, who said you could keep your doctors. And it turns out you couldn't keep your doctors. But right. then he went to try and make sure you could keep your doctors. And he was practically crucified like Jesus on the cross. Now we have a guy who four years ago said, I'm going to build a wall. They're going to pay for it. And where are we three years later? 
his buddies have stolen some of the money and yeah. nobody, the same people who wanted to send uh, Barack Obama back to where he was born, which it turns out was Hawaii, which is still, it's one of the last states, but it's still part of the United States. They don't give a shit. The one guy who golfed too much and said you could keep your doctor and didn't, they want to run him out on a rail. The other guy who golfs even more and has lied about a bunch of stuff, everything's copacetic, man. Yeah, well. What, what happened to this country? That's a good question. You know, That's a good question. made Barack Obama out. I mean, they literally made him out to be the Antichrist. I remember there was this one guy who used to call him Nikolai Carpathia, who was this fictional character from one of these, you know, weird- The Left Behind books. Yes. Right, right, right. 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 The weird Christian rapture series. Thing. And, you know, I mean, this is what they did to Barack Obama. Meanwhile, you know, when Donald Trump comes along, they liken Donald Trump to King Cyrus. Like, this is, these are the kinds of games that these people play, you know, with these kinds of metaphors and with these good books. I mean, there is no real middle. There is no center. And this is the thing that, you know, I, I, I tell people, like, you know, I don't, I, I've, I've always felt like, well, I've long felt like, not always, but I've long felt like the Republican Party was just becoming just, you know, just another hate group. Because, I mean, you know, there were, there were you know, I, I can remember when, you know, I mean, I was a young dude, but, you know, I remember when Republicans were reasonable people to some degree, you know what I mean? I mean, I didn't, I was never crazy about the William F. Buckley's and all those kinds of people. But, you know, I understood that, you know, that, you know, I, you know, when I got to college and really started reading Edmund Burke, I was like, okay, there were some things about conservatism in and of itself that seem logical, at least within the realm of reason. But what, you know, what I have seen happen, you know, and, and I mean, this didn't start with Trump. I mean, Ronald Reagan making his, you know, his speech, you know, to, 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 to become the, you know, his candidate, his, uh, his, his speech to run for president in Philadelphia, Mississippi in 1980. Um, Richard Nixon talking about, you know, law and order and, and, you know, making that a big thing. And then talking about black power being black capitalism and these sorts of things. I mean, you know, this kind of pimping out of rhetoric of people who are supposed to be principled, this kind of constant moving of the goalposts. I mean, for me, this is kind of what America has always been about. I mean, growing up in Detroit, all I ever heard in the Reagan years were personal responsibility. Like that was, that was, I mean, they shoved that down our throats. There were books written. I remember Alan Bloom and all of these people writing all of these books, you know, uh, about, you know, the need for personal responsibility and, you know, the, the truly disadvantage of William Dewey's supposed to do the world coming out of, oh, well, you know, there are poor people and there are super poor people and only the super poor people have a claim in it. I mean, it's just like, you know, there's this constant moving of the goalposts in this country. And, and that's why I say, you know, you're never really clear on, you know, what you're supposed to be about. I mean, I remember when Keith Butler and all these folks were all the rage in Detroit and were encouraging people, you know, the black church, black church members to take a position within the Republican Party precisely because of the morality that was supposed, you know, we're anti-abortion, you know, we look at, you know, homosexuality as a sin, all of these kinds of moral plays. And it's just, you know, this is why you say this never meant anything. This is all, I, I, you're here for the racism. I mean, that's it, plain and simple. You will never convince, well, the racism of the tax Came for the tax cuts and stayed for the racism. Came for the racism, right? <laughs> so for the racism. And, and there is nothing beyond this as far as many of us can see. I mean, you know, sure, you may get some, you know, you may get to take a, a swipe or two at folks in the court, but do you really think Donald Trump is anti-abortion? Donald Trump has probably paid for more abortion, oh. you know, than all of us. Yeah, I mean, you know, do you really think that Donald Trump gives a, gives a damn? Obviously about fidelity, you're banging porn stars raw while your wife is pregnant. Yeah, I mean, all of these kinds of things, let me know that this is about none of the things that these people but claim. Darryl, Darryl. It's like about the Civil War, was about, you know, northern aggression. You're a goddamn lie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and, and you get to a point where when you're the one who's dying as a result of this hypocrisy. You but see, I know you're wrong, Daryl, because I saw on the internet a picture that somebody painted of Jesus with his hand on Donald Trump's shoulder. Right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the kind of crap. All right, Alan, go ahead. I thought, that was, I thought there was Ben Carson who was hanging out with Jesus in that portrait. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be both of them. As Jesus. See, that's what you got to yeah. uh, maybe, maybe, go. maybe he was making well, wait, the rounds. They can't have that because that would be a black Jesus, Daryl, and that's just not what happened. Come on now. <laughs> go ahead, Alan. of the week. Yeah, let's do smuck of the say, week. Let's do smuck. Right. It's wait, hold on a second. Let me preface this. Some people may think this is a little harsh, but well, wait, 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 uh, wait, 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 wait. Let me set it up. Let me set it up. Yes. Because you know, just because of this conversation today, 
We are about to make our nominees this week for the Donald J, the J stands for genius, Trump Schmuck of the Week Award. Alan Langle gets to go first. There you go, sir. I have to say, and this may, some people may think this is a little harsh, but the woman who spoke uh, last night and who attended the, uh, the ceremonies at, at the White House, uh, whose husband had died, uh, the St. Louis uh, cop who, who was killed, and whose, whose uh, children today had said that their father would have basically been appalled that she had attended and tried to use her husband's death to promote Donald Trump's agenda when her husband thought Donald Trump was a racist and was not a good president. It was not for him and would have been appalled that he was part of that. And, and I, I, I find that really just selfish. And I, I, I have to give the schmuck of the week to her. All right, there's the, there's one nominee right there. Uh, who wants to go next with their schmuck of the week? Should I go next? I've got a pretty good one. Yeah, you go next. Okay. Uh, it's going to be um, our good buddy, Jacob Wall. Now, do you know who he is? Okay, Jacob Wall. Yes, who he was Paul- number two on my list, so now I'm going to have to all, go to okay. all these political stunts that he pulls, you know, these giant press conferences that, that you oh, know, right going to show that you know, the president had a, had a gay lover or, you know, not, not President Trump, but always Obama. He did a couple of those. And he's basically an internet troll. Well, he and his buddy, uh, Mr. Burkhart, I think is his name, Berkman, um, have been doing robocalls to black voters in Detroit, suggesting that if they vote by mail, that they are going to basically use that information so they can go through police records, find people over warrants, uh, all this kind of stuff. So the point that, that basically uh, you had Jocelyn Benson having to come out yesterday, the Secretary of State, saying this is not true. We don't use any of this information. We are not finding out where, you know, who's got warrants and all that kind of stuff. Basically trying to stop people from voting by mail. Um, and Dana Nessel's looking like she may actually bring a lawsuit on this one, which I think would be good because I guarantee you, if it's happening here, it is happening in a bunch of things. So yes, what they're saying about voting by mail is that they are going to be used by police to exercise warrants, credit card companies to help collect debts, and the CDC to track people for mandatory vaccines. So Jake <laughs> Ball, wow. who is a dirty trickster, a uh, par excellence, and a total scumbag, is my schmuck of the week. He's actually a dirty trickster par incompetence. Oh, yes, um, well, that's he's true. Basically, he's really known for how terribly these uh, stunts that he tries uh, but, to pull off. But these robocalls are scummy. Like when, really he tried, when he tried to uh, portray Elizabeth Warren as having some sort of uh, sexual affair with a young oh, Marine. That's I right. I forgot scary. about that one. <laughs> All right, um, Daryl, who do you got this week? Yeah, you know, Jacob Wall is a good one, though, because he's like, the <laughs> cigar always blows up. In his, he's like Wiley Coyote. <laughs> <laughs> he's Wiley Coyote. <laughs> Wiley Coyote is political uh, My smug of, uh, of the week is Herschel Walker. Uh, Herschel Walker. Uh, Herschel yeah. Walker. Yeah. Walker man. Of mean, the New oh, Jersey Generals. Don't forget that connection. To Trump. That's right. <laughs> oh, no, I, that's, that's, that, 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 you know, that's exactly what it's about. You know, while Trump was running what I consider to be one of the best non-NFL football leagues ever in my lifetime um, uh, into the ground, which was the USFL. You know, I went to Michigan Panthers game, right? It I'm, was our only championship in football. Come on you know, now. I'm I was, and, I, and they were good. I, I was a fan. They got Anthony Carter the whole night. I was a fan. But, you know, to watch Herschel Walker, who, you know, is inarguably, you know, one of the greatest running backs and truly one of the greatest athletes, one of the greatest American athletes of the 20th century, go up there and participate in this kind of fiction, you know, um, in the and in, in, in a very intentionally racialized kind of fiction. To watch him sort of take his experiences and his 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 presence as a young person in the South, you know, and try and use that. That's that's real cred, man, to me. That's real credibility. I mean, I believe right. Marshall Walker says, you know, I, I know what racism is. There's no way you didn't grow up in Georgia and you don't. But the problem is. You know, you know, white supremacy can do one of two things to black people in this country. It can firm you up and it can make you all the more determined to fight to dismantle this thing, or it can break you and drive you insane. And I think that Herschel Walker, sadly, is a prime example of somebody who's just simply been driven crazy. Um, you know, whether it's because, you know, to, to, to ML's point, you know, I know Donald Trump helped make him a very wealthy man, he, you know, paid him, made him the star of the New Jersey Generals, basically the face of the USFL for a minute. Um, you know, I get that 
maybe Herschel feels like he owes some kind of economic debt to Donald Trump that, you know, goes beyond, you know, Trump's politics and policies. But that does not give you a right to go up there and try to reinterpret this man for the rest of it. I grew up under racism too. You know what I'm saying? We all know this. And I felt like I was being gaslit. You know what I mean? And, 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 and it was so, you know, just, just fundamentally disrespectful. I mean, I didn't like, I thought, I thought Tim Scott was a close second. But, you know, I mean, Herschel Walker is just a guy. I mean, this was just so gratuitous. I mean, at least Tim Scott is tied into the Republican Party. He's probably afraid for a whole lot of reasons. But, you know, to see Herschel Walker do something like this, I thought was, you know, and then his son followed it up with an with a Instagram <laughs> post where he called, um, he called Blake uh, a, a criminal who deserved to be shot seven times. So wow. not only are you, yeah, you're, so now, you know, you've created, you cloned yourself, basically. You know, he's a, he's a male cheerleading clone version of, of his pop out here in terms of this whole spewing this kind of, you know, anti-Black hate, which is essentially what it is. Herschel Walker's as big a white supremacist as Donald Trump. I agree. I, wow. I, was, I, I was not I expecting a Herschel Walker that. nomination today. I, I was appalled by that, by his uh, appearance. I, I was watching it going, what the hell is going on here, bud? All right. So, so let's, uh, let's go to uh, ML for his schmuck of the week. Known so, as Geek of the Week on his program. That, that's right. So, so I, um, I, I know what I'm about to say is going to have people call me a libtard, uh, uh, a partisan, and all this other stuff. But this really is a truly impartial statement. But if you think Barack Obama played too much golf and you don't think that Donald Trump plays too much golf, you're my schmuck of the week every week. <laughs> <laughs> but he donates his salary. Yeah. Yeah, to I mean, buy a portrait of himself. Well, yeah, he, yeah, he donates his salary, but the Secret Service pays it yeah. back in, in hotel rooms every year, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. All right, Nancy, who do you got? Um, I was going to go with Jacob Wool. You stole it from me. We already talked Sorry. about we the Mikulovskis. So I am going to go with Lou Holtz. Wow, um, Lou, Lou Holtz. Holtz, the uh, former uh, what is it, Notre Dame coach? Uh, former Notre Dame coach, and yes. uh, you know who yeah. who Arkansas well. from apparently, apparently he's now an appendix, uh, an attaché to the Pope because he declared at the convention that Biden is Catholic in name only. And I can only quote the great Jim Gaffigan, who went on an absolutely spectacular and epic Twitter rant last night after the Trump speech. And he said, Biden is Catholic in name only compared to who? How many abortions did Trump pay for? How many women has he raped? Wake up. And it's true. If I had one question that I could ask the president of the United States, assuming that he was under sodium pentothal, it would be <laughs> how many abortions have you funded in your life mr president and i will put the over i'll take the over and under action at eight i have a feeling that mr cohen might be telling us that pretty soon so i hope so i have a feeling he's got <laughs> some of that information but uh, all right we're gonna have to wrap it up there uh, for the week because we've been going a long time and i certainly appreciate everybody who watched today it's a big deal if you like this show, make sure you subscribe to it. Make sure you like it. Share it with your friends. All that good stuff. Also, check out my friend ML Elric's show, Soul of Detroit, which you can also find anywhere you find podcasts. Uh, and he will be right here on Facebook telling you when it's going to be on as well. I do believe you've been working on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Wednesday. Uh, we do a live Facebook broadcast on Tuesday, and then we post the audio on Wednesday. And uh, I'm working on some things for the free press, I think, either Sunday or Monday. We're going to have an exclusive report coming up that I think people will find interesting. And uh, I know there's always good stuff at Deadline Detroit. So please subscribe to both. Yeah, there you go. Any, any hints, ML, on, on who's uh, in the crosshairs this week? Uh, it, it's, uh, well, um, let's just say a major institution. <laughs> okay, Ooh, very good. We'll good leave one. it at that. I'm looking forward to that. I'd like to thank Daryl Dossie for being with us as well. Uh, I appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, your volume just went away for some reason. I'm not sure what happened there. But I'd like to also thank Nancy Derringer for being here as usual. And, of course, Alan Langell. And a big thanks to, uh, to uh, Michael Lucido as well for engineering the broadcast as he does each and every week. Don't forget, if you missed some of this, it'll be available as a podcast later today. We will have the video up on DeadlineDetroit.com sometime tomorrow. But go to DeadlineDetroit.com 
any time because there's all kinds of stuff that is there that you will learn when you go to that site each and every day. And we all want to be, we all want to be educated about the news, right? We all want to <laughs> know what is happening each and every day. So Deadline Detroit can help you do that. Same with the free press, same with the Detroit news. I don't care which paper you read, just read one of them. It's a big deal. Subscribe to one of them. Subscribe to Deadline Subscribe Detroit. To it's cheap. Subscribe yeah. to all of them like I do. It's important. Yeah. So anyway, thanks everybody. Have a fantastic weekend. And Alan, Stay home safely. <laughs> My name's M.L. Elric. I'm an investigative reporter and a connoisseur of fine yogurts. I know a little bit about Detroit. I know a little bit about deadlines. And I'm asking you to become a member of DeadlineDetroit.com, like me. I'm not asking you to do anything I wouldn't do. I'm making a monthly donation. My wife is making a monthly donation. I know that seems redundant, but they need the money, and the money goes to a good place. Getting the story out, getting the truth out. Because if we don't support local journalism, there's some people a couple blocks away from here who are going to get away with a whole bunch of stuff that's going to cost you a whole lot more than just a few bucks out of your pocket every month. Go to DeadlineDetroit.com, become a member. You'll see it's really easy at the top of the website. Give early, give often, give generously. Just give a damn. That's the best way I know how.